Hi, folks. I'm Tatiana Stanton, Cornell University's Small Ruminant Extension Specialist. The following presentation is part of a video course on artificial insemination in goats that was funded in large part through a Northeast Sustainable Agriculture and Research Education Grant. I have a strong background in goat rearing as well as a PhD in animal breeding and have been asked to talk to you about choosing a sire. In the case of artificial insemination, this essentially boils down to what semen should I use? I have borrowed from resources developed by Rene Delu, Dr. George Wiggins, and various breed associations for part of this presentation. Some of the information is going to be applicable to sheep as well as to goats. In part one of this video on choosing a sire, we're going to discuss the selection criteria and methods you can use to select what sires to buy semen from. In deciding what semen to use, a helpful first step is to determine the actual goals of your breeding program. And this means you need to identify what traits are most important to the improvement of your herd while avoiding inbreeding and serious defects. The traits you want to emphasize are going to vary from farm to farm. For example, in a commercial operation, important traits are likely to be those that impact the survivability of your farm. For example, increased milk yield should improve productivity while improving your teat structure might influence milking speed and hence labor efficiency. In contrast, for a small show herd relying on the sale of breeding stock, choosing a sire may appear to be simply a matter of identifying bucks with a lot of name recognition for their bloodlines or for the herds they're from and doing price comparisons between their semen costs. Keep in mind that you can't ignore the traits that your herd is already so strong in. Forgetting to include them in your breeding program can lead to poorer, poorer performance in these traits in future generations. Genetics is not static. Instead, genetic progress in your herd is a continuous pro process. It's impacted by the decisions you make about what animals to keep and breed, which specific matings to make, and which animals you're gonna cull. The culling you currently do can tell you a lot about what traits are important in your herd. What's the most important, most common reason for you to have to involuntarily cull a doe? Is it leg problems, low milk yield, poor parasite resistant? But you also have to ask yourself, are these reasons or are these problems re affected by your herd's genetics? For example, if you're having to do a lot of culling for mastitis, do poor low hanging udders contribute to it, which would be a genetic, a genetic effect? Or is it strictly a management issue, in which case you have to work on that poor management? rather than trying to use genetics to solve your mastitis problem. What are your primary reasons for voluntarily culling animals, especially when you consider where your farm income comes from? Do you voluntarily cull because of low milk yield, low protein, low mothering, poor mothering, weak conformation, bad attitude? Again, you need to ask yourself, how much are these particular traits influenced by genetics? Have you identified which goats are the best performers in your herd? This could be in terms of generating the most income for your farm or being the most trouble-free, et cetera, depending on what factors more, most influence your farm's survivability. If you have identified the best performers, what genetic traits do you attribute their success to? When you decide what animals to keep, what traits influence that decision? Are these traits the same as those of your best performers? If they're different, you may want to reconsider. Again, how much are the traits you are selecting on based on genetics rather than on environment? For example, 
If you're so selecting for size in a meat goat herd, are you accounting for kids that are raised as singles having a growthier environment and hence just because of environment being bigger than twins or triplets? If not, you may continually select for singles and gradually affect the genetics of your litter size. When deciding what traits to focus on in selecting a sire, there's a few basic facts to keep in mind. Number one, the phenotype of your animal is essentially what your animal looks like and performs like. It is the sum of the genetics she inherited, i.e. her genotype, and the environment she was exposed to. For example, was she raised as a single kid or as a triplet? Was she exposed to good management or to poor management? The second thing to keep in mind is that in the world of animal breeding, the word heritability is used to express the percentage of the total variation for a trait that is due to genetics. For example, when you look at differences in milk yield in the US doe population, how much of that difference is due to genetics versus to environmental differences? Some very obvious environmental differences that affect milk yield our herd management, the season a doe is milking in, and the age she is at that particular milking. This slide lists estimates of heritability for some traits of interest to goat and sheep farms. I should point out that ironically, the amount of heritability expressed can be influenced by the overall environment. For example, when you look at milk yield in a very restricted environment, such as where you've got really poor nutrition or really hot weather, like in the tropics, does that, those that would normally be heavy milkers are not going to be able to express their full potential. So the difference between them and poor milkers in the same herd is going to be less, leading to a lower heritability for milk than in more promising environments. The rate of genetic progress in a herd is determined by number one, the generation interval. And keep in mind that goats and sheep have an advantage over cattle because they take less time to reach sexual maturity and have a shorter gestation or pregnancy period and thus have a shorter generation interval. Genetic progress is also affected by the heritability of the traits you are selecting for. The lower the heritabilities, the slower the genetic progress is gonna be. And thirdly, genetic progress is affected by your selection in in intensity. Are you selecting only from the top 20% of sires for a particular trait, or are you including all of the top 50% of the sires when, for that trait when you look at selecting a sire? I wanna emphasize here that as the number of traits you select for increases, the progress in any one trait is going to tend to decrease because the selection intensity you can apply to each individual trait is usually going to have to decrease. The greatest impact on genetic progress is from the selection of your males. This is simply because bucks and rams potentially have more offspring than does and ewes and also because the progeny of rams and bucks are more likely to be represented in different environments, i.e. different herds, different years, different seasons than those of female parents. Therefore, you get the opportunity to evaluate the progeny of, or the offspring of bucks and rams phenotypes across many different environments which leads to a more accurate determination of their actual genotypes. Hopefully the topics we have considered in the previous slides have helped you to determine some of your breeding goals, but how do you actually evaluate what sire to get semen from? When you buy a new herd sire or take a doe to a buck to get bred, you usually get a chance to see the actual buck and you get to see the farm he's from firsthand and can ask the owner questions directly. 
But with artificial insemination, you will usually need to figure out what online information is available on, your, on those bucks. Are there online photos or just the owner's description of the buck and his relatives? Are there farm or show records? And if so, are they verified by a third party, such as dairy herd improvement, DHI, or by a breed association? Has the animal or, or any of his close relatives participated in official phenotype evaluations, such as linear appraisal or in official genetic evaluations? And if so, do you know how to evaluate this information? Genetic evaluation programs are, a very valuable, are very valuable tools for selecting sires. A big benefit of these programs is they allow you to compare offspring that are being raised in different environments, for example, in different herds. On-farm genetic evaluations generally include adjustment factors to separate out differences in performances that are due to effects, to effects such as herd, sex, litter size, age or season of freshening, rather than due to actual genetics. Now we also have regional performance tests where weaned male lambs or kids, i.e. prospective bucks and prospective rams, are brought together from different farms uh, for a period of time to see what their growth performance is when they're fed the same feed ration, et cetera. But unfortunately, you need to keep in mind that in these performance tests, we're gonna be more limited in what environmental adjustment factors we can actually adjust for. The accuracy of on-farm genetic evaluations is affected by number one, the number of animals performing in the same herd year season. The more animals there are, the better estimates you're gonna get of the actual effect of that herd year season on the traits you're evaluating. Number two, the number of sires who offspring are performing in the same herd year season. The more sires represented, the more direct comparisons you have between their genetics. And this leads to a more accurate ranking of the sires. Number three, the accuracy of a sire's evaluation also increases as the total, as his total number of records and offspring increase. And lastly, the completeness and accuracy of the pedigree information and of the records themselves has a huge influence on the accuracy of a genetic evaluation. If the sire information is incorrect, or if the records for some reason are false on a bunch of the offspring that are listed as being his, then the evaluation will essentially be trash. Just to make things more complicated, different genetic evaluations use different terms to express the genetic merit of an animal. Estimated breeding value, or EBV, is the estimate of an animal's own genetic value. Whereas predicted transmitting, transmitting ability, or, e, or PTA, is only going to be half of the EBV value, because it is the expected genetic contribution of that parent to its progeny. The other half of the, of the baby's genetics is going to be inherited from the other parent. So therefore, we, when we look at what that sire is going to contribute to that offspring, we look at his PTA generally rather than his, which is half of his EBA. Estimated transmitting ability or ETA is used by the American Dairy Goat Association when the EBV and therefore the PTA of an animal is only based on the performance of its ancestors, i.e. the animal has no official records yet on itself or on its offspring. Once that young buck starts having daughters milking, then it'll start getting PTAs for those daughters. A logical approach to determine what semen to use on your herd is the following stepwise approach. As already discussed, identify your herd's genetic weaknesses and strength and determine what traits 
you should emphasize in a breeding program. Then review the pedigrees of your animals and of potential sires to control for inbreeding. You're also going to check, want to check for special issues such as poleness or carrier genes that might lead to serious problems. Use available online records and genetic evaluations to help you rank those sires. And then use a spreadsheet or ranking approach to look at the actual EBVs or, ET or PTAs on the sires if they're available. Lastly, select the sires to buy from after looking at all those things and also considering the semen prices versus your insemination expertise. If you know that your conception rates tend to be pretty low when you AI and that you still need some more experience under your belt, you're not gonna want to buy extremely expensive semen for your first tries. There are several methods that livestock breeders have used in the past to select matings. One of these is tandem selection, where you focus on one trait, for example, milk yield, until your herd meets that goal, and then switch your focus to another treat that needs improvement, for example, milk protein percentage. The disadvantage of tandem selection is that you can easily lose progress in the trait you are ignoring. In fact, if the traits are negatively correlated, which is actually the case for the most part with milk yield and protein percentage, you might find your herd seesawing back and forth uh, between improvement and these traits and making no real progress at all. Keep in mind that the reason we tend to see a negative correlation between milk yield and protein percentage is because the easiest way for nature to make more milk is to just dilute the milk, i.e. to create those that tend to have lower concentration of milk solids in their milk, resulting in more milk, but less protein percentage. Another method that can be tempting to use for individual matings is non-assortative mating. In this case, you breed an animal that is weak in some traits to an animal that is strong in the same traits in the search for the perfect animal. Often this selection involves several traits. However, remember from an earlier slide that the more traits you include in a selection program, the slower the progress tends to be in any one trait. Also, this method encourages you to do a lot of individual matings usually using several different sires. Semen is usually cheaper when bought in sets of straws rather than as a whole bunch of individual straws from a lot of different sires. Instead, the last two selection methods listed here are usually recommended. Individual culling level is a method where sires are only considered if they meet certain standards for a few specific traits. For example, you might consider only alpine bucks that rank in the top 25% for predicted transmitting ability for milk yield and also have positive uh, predicted transmitting abilities for milk fat and overall linear appraisal. The selection index method uses select, uh, selection indices to select sires. These indices are created by weighing a few important traits by their relative value and then calculating each sire's overall score. For example, if you are a commercial dairy and get paid so much for each pound of milk with an additional bonus for protein, you might come up with a selection index that contains these two factors weighted by their relative effect on your milk check. One advantage of selection indices is that you're able to consider several traits and still make more progress than if you looked at each trait individually. 